Let's have a look at cavity design. The intended learning outcomes for this presentation are 1. Outline the cavity, cavity classification systems that use location and size um, and using the correct dental terminology which you would have learned in iOS. So the correct uh, tooth uh, number, the correct tooth surface and the characteristics or physical features of the teeth and the tooth surfaces. Two, describe the principles of cavity design. And whilst um, cavities will all look slightly different to a certain degree, there are a number of, a group of principles that we apply to pretty much um, all cavities. And understanding those principles is really quite important. And lastly, and most importantly, is that your cavity design, you're able to relate what that should look like based on the pathology or trauma or damage to the tooth that you see clinically, and based on the type of dental material um, that you're going to use. So what your cavity design ends up looking like should be a careful consideration of those uh, things first and we'll explore this a little bit more. But just to put it in context, remember our approach to managing dental caries is one of minimal intervention dentistry. This is the modern concept for managing this disease process and it is a holistic patient-based uh, philosophy which includes multiple elements. The first and most important is our preventive approaches. So trying to control the disease process. And two of the ways we can do that are by reducing the cariogenic bacterial load in a patient's mouth. And if there are early lesions or early um, carious um, lesions in the mouth, we should be trying to reverse them or arrest them with a remineralization process so that we prevent destruction of the tooth tissue and we prevent having to replace it with a prosthetic dental restoration, which are never as good as the original tooth tissues. It also means that when we look at broken down or um, cracked or defective restorations, we carefully consider whether they can be repaired rather than completely replaced. It is much more expensive and more destructive to the tooth if we remove restorations completely and then place a new one. So we'd rather repair and limit the damage to the tooth uh, with a, a restoration that has a slight defect than replace the whole thing. And lastly, the third element uh, in this overall care philosophy is restoring cavitated lesions when they are cavitated. So when they are irreversibly cavitated and we can no longer uh, attempt to reverse or arrest the lesion. So the minimally invasive restoration is um, our last option for the management of caries. Shouldn't be the first option. And a reminder that minim minimally invasive restoration, uh, which is only used when we have irreversible damage, should be guided by these ideas. When we pick up a handpiece or a sharp um, um, excavation or, sh or other instrument for removing tooth tissue, we should be only removing that part of the tissue which cannot be saved or preserved. So that's minimal removal of destroyed tooth tissue, but maximal presentation of sound demineralized tooth tissues. And lastly, we should place the most suitable material into that cavity uh, to um, service the tooth, but also our choice of um, restorative material should also be based on uh, preservation of tooth. So adhesive um, rest restorative materials um, um, are more commonly favoured today
than things like amalgam which require more extensive tooth removal in order to be retained. So looking at our um, tooth and cross section here, the tissues we want to or have to remove are the necrotic or destroyed um, uh, dentine and any unsupported enamel. So enamel prisms that are not sitting on sound dentine, they may also have to be um, eliminated. The deeper um, affected dentine, we would try to preserve or keep that uh, in place. So these are the things we should recall um, when we're planning uh, the design of our cavity. And cavitation is the critical point. So right up into that point, we should be attempting everything we possibly can uh, to reverse or arrest the, the, um, the lesion before it cavitates. Um, once it's cavitated, uh, it may need restoration. And really, we need to keep in mind that cavitation is an indication that our therapeutic or preventive approaches have failed. Now, Banerjee, uh, who was the author of the reading that you should be looking at in, in conjunction with this presentation, um, presents this very simple um, but um, significant idea that minimal intervention dentistry or invasive, minimally invasive restoration relies on good knowledge of the dental, by, of the dental operator in three important areas. So he presents this golden triangle, this triad um, of things that we need to know. One is the histology of dental tissues. So you should know um, about the histology, the structure, um, the degree of um, cellular or uh, acellular um, parts of the tooth, um, the inorganic versus the organic proportion of the tooth, the amount of moisture that's present in each of the dental tissues, uh, all of those things um, are important because they will determine how much of the tissue you remove, but they'll also determine the type of dental materials that you are able to use effectively against those tissues. The second uh, point in our triad here is the characteristics of the dental materials themselves. So we're not going to spend too much time thinking about that today, but over time you will learn much more about dental material science and your knowledge about the way dental materials uh, behave and the way they react when they're placed against dental tissues, different dental tissues, dentine for example, uh, will um, interact with dental materials in a different way to enamel for example. So those are things we need to know. And lastly, the cavity cleaning techniques. So the techniques and the materials and instruments that are required to clean the cavity and to remove um, tooth tissue that does need to be removed, we need to have a careful understanding of the effectiveness uh, and the use of each of those things. And you'll note from this triad that these things are interactive. So your histology, uh, not knowledge of the histology of dental tissues will very much um, influence the type of dental materials you'll use and vice versa. The type of dental materials that you may choose will be determined by the histology of the dental materials present in your cavity. The cleaning will be influenced by the histology and also by uh, the characteristics of the restorative materials. So not an in-depth knowledge of these three areas is really critical. At this stage you have a beginner insight into them. Um, but I'm just highlighting to you now that these are important things to think about when we get into more sophisticated cavity design. And here's the paper that I was just referring to, um, so it will be on LMS for you to read. I want you to read this and understand the concepts well. I've taken out a couple of sentences here which I think are really important. And what um, the author suggests is that minimally inv invasive dentistry allows the dental practitioner to approach the disease in a more medical way as a physician rather than as a technician or surgeon that just cuts out things um, without thinking about being able to cure or preserve tissues in place with mineralization. So the past approach to um, restoring teeth has meant that we've been overly destructive of teeth which means that they fail ultimately um, so we don't do patients any favors. So taking um, 
so looking at cavity design as this is a particular shape that I have to produce no matter what the pathology looks like is no longer an idea that we support. So that predetermined shape that we used to teach in dental schools is no longer valid in uh, our modern understanding of disease. So putting aside this predetermined shape allows us to choose um, uh, an approach to cavity design which is based on the histopathology of the disease rather than what we have to do in order to keep the restorative material in place. And what this does is allows us to retain um, more tooth substance than we would have um, perhaps in the past. So remember, uh, my view is that restorations are placed primarily to bring the biofilm to the surface out of the cavities which patients cannot access to remove biofilm effectively and to seal off the cavity from the substrate, the sugars that are available in the mouth when we eat so that the lesion cannot progress. They're the key reasons for um, placing restorations. So you will see this picture you'll recognize um, outlines the two zones that we need to consider when designing um, cavities. So uh, which part of the tooth structure needs to be removed and which part of the tooth structure needs to be retained. So this more superficial or infected or destroyed layer of dentine needs to be removed. So this would be included in our cavity um, design. We'd also need to then consider that this is potentially unsupported enamel and we may need to eliminate that. And the same thing here. Okay, so our final cavity design may look something like that. Another example here, you can see that we don't have an open uh, cavity. We have a, a breakdown or a cavitation of enamel here. Um, but in order to access this necrotic dentine here, we actually need to cut through uh, relatively sound enamel. And to do that, we'd need to use a high-speed air turbine um, uh, handpiece uh, with a, an effective cutting um, burr. And again, once we have thought about this, we need to remove all of this necrotic dentine, which means that this unsupported enamel <coughs> excuse me, would have to be uh, included in our cavity design. So remember the enamel prisms are uh, sitting almost perpendicular to the dentinal surface, so this is all supported enamel. This unsupported enamel, which is sitting on necrotic dentine, it's unsupported, it'll collapse, needs to be removed. Here we can see some radiographs which are showing us radiolucent areas which indicate significant loss of minerals and therefore probably um, significant curious dentine. So here we see um, a large area which is probably necrotic dentine. Here is the small cavity um, in the surface of the enamel. But you can see here that um, in order to remove this lesion uh, we can't actually come in from the side because the, sorry, the um, six-year-old molar is sitting adjacent to it. So what we would need to do is cut through from the occlusal uh, in order to gain access to that lesion. So our cavity design may end up looking something like this. And additionally, we may cut a retentive area into the occlusal, so our final outline in cross-section may look something like this. Here we can see uh, that the um, occlusal surface indicates that there is probably a cavitated lesion here into dentine, and if we were able to look at the tooth in cross-section, which we are here, um, but we can't do that clinically, you can see that there is dental involvement and probably uh, cavitation here. But in this part of the tooth um, is a, a non-cavitated lesion 
and you can see we're not getting significant involvement of the dentine. So in this particular case, we can access from the occlusal, so we'd use our high-speed handpiece to remove enamel, and this is the shape uh, from the occlusal of our cavity. This is actually called the outline form. Okay, This area we would probably leave, we wouldn't cut into that, but we, put, we, we would want to seal that. In cross-section, our cavity from the occlusal, removing the necrotic dentine, would probably look something like that. So let's have a look at where these lesions will be and potentially consider how the principles of cavity design may be applied slightly differently according to the surfaces of the teeth that are affected. Now dental caries can affect of course any part of the tooth where plaque is left to accumulate. But most commonly uh, in uh, human teeth, we will see three areas where we will get uh, cavitation. The pits and fissures of the teeth, and these commonly occur on the occlusal surface, but may also occur on the palatal surfaces uh, of um, molars. There's a palatal groove um, commonly um, behind um, the front teeth, so the um, palatal surfaces of incisors. Um, and the buccal surface of lower molars are commonly uh, pitted. So here we can see a uh, occlusal pit and fissure uh, cavity. It's quite a woofer, it's quite large, quite obvious, um, um, but on the occlusal surface of the tooth we would probably have quite a large outline form and we would need to consider very carefully a dental material with high compressive strength um, we'd want to design the cavity uh, itself so that it had um, retentive and resistant form uh, features built into it. Here we can see, uh, this is a, a child patient of mine, um, and uh, you can see that they have six-year-old molars, but they still have the deciduous anterior lower teeth, so they're probably about six years old. This child's lost a tooth due to caries. Uh, and you can see cavitations occurring here, both on the occlusal surface and interdentally um, uh, between the two primary molars. Now, here we'd have to think very carefully about what uh, restorative material we're going to use. And in this particular case, because this is a mixed dentition, one of the other things we need to think about is how long this particular tooth is going to be in the mouth. All right, So that would help us to determine which material we would um, choose and of course we would need to know uh, about the durability and the lifespan of different dental materials. Okay, So if this child was much older, if they were 10 for example, we may choose to place a, a simple restoration here uh, using a glass iron and a cement. But they are sick so this tooth actually has to stay here for how long? Another six years potentially. So we may think of a, a, a dental material with um, uh, greater longevity. In this case, it would probably be a stainless steel crown. Okay, but that's a different story. Here we can see multiple curious lesions, but they are all of the white spot or incipient or non cavitated type at the moment. But if you just imagine if we left the plaque here for long enough, we could end up with cavities uh, looking like this. In which case we'd need to think very carefully about the dental material because you can see here in this picture uh, the patient is in maximum interdigitation and you can see that this spot here actually is not under any occlusal pressure. So our cavity design, the, the amount of tooth, that we, tooth structure that we remove could be very, very minimal, right? just restricted to the necrotic tissue itself. Uh, and then we could place something like a GIC, for example, because it's under no... Um, significant stress, so it doesn't need that compressive strength. Um, we could place a resin composite, but of course it would depend on how well we can isolate the cavity from uh, fluids because they're very um, um, moisture uh, sensitive, right? So if we can get good isolation here to stop the fluids from the crevic, um, gingival crevice from seeping out onto the operative site, then we may choose a, a resin composite.
Here I've included just for completeness uh, an example of a class 6 or cuspal uh, um, uh, tip uh, cavity. You can see here the cavity is occurring on what's this? This is the lower 6, so there's the mesiobuccal, the midbuccal or true buccal, and the distobuccal cusp. So on the tip of the uh, mid buccal or true buccal cusp, you can see that there is a cavity here. That is unusual because we don't usually see developmental grooves, pits, or fissures in these areas. It's probably some sort of developmental defect in this area that's then collected plaque, which has then become carious. Unusual, but you may see this. Um, and as I say, I've included it for completeness here. So, what determines our cavity design? Well, the basics are the disease, how much of the tooth has been destroyed, right? is it a very little bit, or is it a big woofer like this one here? Okay, So that will help to us to make decisions about what the uh, final cavity design is going to look like. We also remember need to think about the dental materials, so what are we going to use to restore the tooth, is it an adhesive material? Um, here we've lost one of the cusps of the teeth. So, you know, an adhesive material might be indicated, but it's going to be under significant occlusal pressure, so we need to think very carefully about that. Um, and the dental tissues um, in the area also will help us to make a decision. Is there dentine involved and enamel, or is it just enamel, or is it large areas of dentine with no enamel? Uh, in this area here, you can see we're getting very close to the cementum and dentine of the root. So if we had no enamel left, let's just say the cavity went all the way down to here, then we wouldn't have a an enamel margin here to bond a material like resin composite to. So we may be forced into using something like a GIC build-up here, and then a resin composite. This is called the, this is the so-called lamination technique. Uh, there to make up for the fact that we don't have um, an, an enamel margin here to bond a resin composite to effectively. So you can see that triad, that golden triangle of all those different elements that we need to consider is really important, particularly when we're faced with something like this. Now, the important principles here, I don't know what this thing here is, but it's pretty annoying. Anyway, just ignore that. There are some important principles, and I've put them in very small text so that you focus in on them, right? That's how psychologically it works. You really concentrate on these things now. The, the principles are principles, right? So they're, they're um, guiding ideas that we will apply generally across all cavities. So they're principles that apply to cavity design. But the way we apply those principles will be determined by those previous characteristics. All right? So they're all about the form that our cavity will take, and they are in alphabetical order. Oh, actually, they're not alphabetical order. They're, okay, they're in no order. Access form, convenience, retention, resistance, and outline. And the names are very set dis descriptive, so you can probably start to understand what these things mean even before I go on to the next slide. But I will go into the next slide anyway, if the board lets me. Okay, so the first one is access. And as the name suggests, it's about being able to access uh, the necrotic tooth tissue. Now, if it's a great big woofen cavity where the enamel's collapsed in and you can see the dentine, the disease has, has created the access for you. But if it's like that one on the radiograph where you cannot not actually see it clinically because it's interproximal, then your access is much more difficult, right? And then you may have to create access artificially by cutting through sound dental tissues to get there. But you need access to be able to see uh, the necrotic dentine, and you need access to be able to get the instruments in to remove it effectively. So access is very important. If you don't have good access to the lesion, you're not going to be able to effectively remove the necrotic tooth tissue. And one of the mistakes people make with minimally invasive dentistry is they think that it's minimally invasive dentistry means really, really super tiny, uber tiny um, fillings uh, or cavities where it actually doesn't, right? It means minimal destruction of tissue but we still need access into it 
um, to be able to restore it appropriately. So keep that in mind. So, talking about access, we have two different cases here. Here is a lesion on the distal surface of a tooth. Now, our access, if there was no tooth next door to it, our access would be relatively simple. We just access from the side uh, into the cavity. We'd remove the necrotic dentine, and then we would eliminate any unsupported enamel. So our cavity design would look something like that. We would have no occlusal pressure from this side onto the tooth, so our design could be fairly minimal fairly rounded and we might choose to use um, a material that doesn't have high compressive strength but very good adhesive qualities and uh, a glass armor cement for example. Um, the other thing about being about this type of approach is that we preserve this important structural um, area here which is the marginal ridge and the marginal ridge comes under a lot of pressure when we bite our teeth together. So if we can preserve that then we are uh, preserving more strength in the tooth. However, if there was a um, tooth next door, we would not be able to access the cavity directly this way. So what we would have to do is to cut through the marginal ridge, eliminate the necrotic um, dentine, and any unsupported enamel and so we would end up with an outline that looks something like this. We may cut into the tooth a little more to give us some sort of retention. So we may end up with a step like that. So you can see that the access is actually creating a larger cavity design um, than is ideal. But what can you do? You have to get to the caries. In this case, we've got an occlusal cavitation, so there's a cavity here, significant um, necrotic dentine. We want to eliminate this necrotic dentine, so we need to be able to get to it. So we would cut through in this direction with a burr, a high-speed handpiece, until we remove the overlying enamel. We could actually see into the cavity. We would probably extend the enamel removal this way so that we eliminate unsupported dentine. Okay, and so our final cavity design may look something like that. So our access here is more direct and results in less removal of sound dental tissue. The outline form, and apologies for the slide, it's not particularly clear, but what the point I'm trying to make here is that the outline is the outline or the border where the margins of the restoration will be. And according to this slide, placing the preparation margins, so the margins of the cavity, in a position uh, where they are um, optimally placed to eliminate unsupported enamel, but trying to preserve as much tooth tissue, particularly cusps and marginal ridges, is our outline form. And what this is actually saying is that you should think before you pick up the handpiece and start cutting, you should be very clear about what your final outline form is going to look like. Let's have, let's have a look at an example of that. Okay, so here we've got uh, the occlusal surface of a molar. And this area here is definitely cavitated. Let's assume that uh, all of this fissure pattern here is cavitated. So what we would want to do is to prepare a cavity which removes unsupported enamel, allows us to access the necrotic dentine. And so we would end up probably with an outline form, outline, that looks something like this. Now, what you'll notice about this outline form is that we have carefully avoided the cusps and the marginal ridges of the tooth. And the reason we do that, if we possibly can, is because the cusps and the marginal uh, ridges uh, and in upper molars, the oblique or transverse ridge 
are, are strength points in teeth and once we start cutting into those we severely weaken the tooth. Now if the caries um, extended underneath this so that the dentine was, under, was destroyed underneath the enamel here then of course we would be forced to open up to remove unsupported enamel. So our final outline form may look something like this. Now you can see the danger here is we've started to cut into the cuspal incline of the teeth, okay, which is going to weaken the tooth. Okay? But we need to gain access to the caries and we need to eliminate unsupported enamel. So in this case we think very carefully about our material. We need to place a material in there that's going to be very resistant to the occlusal force and it's quite strong. Okay? So quite significant compressive strength, an amalgam perhaps. In this area here our outline form as I said before would look something like this if we could come from this side. We usually can't. So our outline form, well that's a little bit excessive isn't it? Our outline form will probably look in cross section like that. Okay, so that's what we mean by the outline form. Where the, mar the outline of the margins. And in the simulation activities you may actually be asked to draw before you start cutting into a tooth what your outline form is going to look like. Okay, so remember that. What is the shape from the occlusal or in cross section on the tooth going to look at? What are the outline or the borders of your cavity? Retention and resistance are two um, related um, uh, features and, or principles. So we'll talk about them sort of together. Retention though means avoiding displacement of a restoration in an occlusal direction, so up out of the cavity, straight up out of the cavity. Now when we used amalgam restorations in the past, because it's not adhesive, we were actually relying on mechanical locking into the tooth surface. So if we uh, consider this light blue area to be the amalgam, uh, what we had to do in order to retain the restoration in the tooth, which is this um, area, darker area here, is we actually had to cut what we call mechanical locks with quite sharp angles, okay, so that uh, if we, you know, bit on a minty and it stuck to the restoration here, and we opened our mouth, we didn't lose the restoration uh, in this um, occlu occlusal direction. So that's the retention form. Now even with adhesive materials, which I'll show you in a moment, we need a certain degree of retention. Uh, form built into our cavity design, but not as much as we did when we were using amalgam. And resistance is cavity form or shape of a cavity that adequately resists the occlusal forces. And in order to achieve this, we look at the cavity floor and we look at its relationship with the uh, direction of the occlusal loading. Okay, so what this means, actually let's go on to the next picture and I'll show you what it means because it's a little difficult to understand um, just using words. Okay, so if we wanted to create the ideal cavity here, we're removing necrotic tissue, we're removing unsupported enamel, we would end up with this type of form. Okay, so what this will do is um, We've got walls of the cavity. Whoops, sorry. We've got walls of the cavity which are sort of at right angles, if we had straight lines, to the floor of the cavity. Okay, so we've got a box form. So if you think of this room, which is relatively small, we've got a floor, which is here, and we've got walls on four sides which are here. This is in cross section so it's only two dimensional. But you've got a box. You pour concrete into that and if the walls are slightly divergent, um, convergent, sorry, as we come towards the surface, it's very hard to pull that concrete block once it's set out of the box because it's locked in. Alright? So that's your retention form. The resistance form is the ability of a restoration to resist 
forces from mastication coming from different directions. Okay, so in order to just illustrate this to you, if we were faced with this lesion clinically and we created a cavity design that eliminated the necrotic caries or dentine, but that we ended up with walls like this, ended up with walls like this, and we placed force here, significant force, which we can generate when we bite our teeth together, here on the restoration, so let's just say this is the restoration, what could happen is the force here could actually cause a tipping out of the restoration, right? So the features of the cavity design which resist that are called resistance form, okay? So the walls and the floors and their relationship with one another is what gives us both our resistance and our retention form. So slightly convergent or walls that are at right angles to the floor of the cavity Okay, will give us that retention and resistance form. So when you're cutting into a tooth, that's what you want to create. Okay, let's have a look at another example here where resistance and retention form is less important. This is a large cavity, but it's on the um, buccal surface of a tooth which is or should not be under direct occlusal pressure, right? So we don't bite down on this part of the tooth, if we, if we do there's something wrong with teeth aren't in, in alignment, okay? So our cavity design, removing necrotic dentine, and maybe a little bit of unsupported enamel here, would look something like that. We could place an adhesive restoration in there, and because there's no forces this way or this way, there's none of those, it's not going to tip out. So our design is much more conservative because it's only it's 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 um, restricted to just the necrotic tooth tissue. Whereas here, we actually do. Oops. Well, that went well, didn't it? Here, we actually do have to cut a little bit um, more of a geometrical shape to allow that resistance and retention form. Um, to be achieved. So they're the principles of cavity preparation which we apply to all cavities but as you would have seen from those examples the shape that we end up very much depends on those three points in the golden triangle. So that's what you need to think about when you are designing cavities. Right? That's the intellectual part of uh, cavity um, preparation. Just cutting a hole in a tooth, you can train a monkey to do that. Well, maybe you can't, but you know it's a fairly basic thing to be able to do just to reproduce a shape mindlessly. But putting everything together and making decisions about what the shape should be, depending on the pathology, the dental materials, and our cavity cleaning techniques, is really the cognitive process that needs to go on in your minds before you pick up the handpiece. Now. Let me introduce you to my favourite burr of all time. It's called the pear-shaped burr, and you can see why it's called a pear-shaped burr. Because it's sort of shaped a little bit like a pear, right? Here's the cutting bit. This is the cutting area of the burr. It's, uh, this one's covered in uh, diamond grit. Uh, so diamond's very hard, it will cut through very hard tissues. You can also get tungsten carbide um, pear-shaped burrs, which have flutes on them. Tungsten carbide is also very hard, as you know, uh, and will cut through um, hard dental tissues. Now the beauty of this particular burr is its shape. Have a look at the shape here, and then what I want you to imagine is if you went down into a tooth, and then pulled the burr across the tooth without lifting it up or down or sideways and pulled it across, what shape cavity would you produce? Push the pause button and to think about it for a moment. <laughs> 
um, pause. You've probably decided now that this is the shape that would result from using the pear shape burr in that manner. And, Cal Surprise, what have we actually got here? We've got the characteristics of the ideal minimal uh, cavity preparation. So we've got a relatively flat floor. We've got walls that are at right angles to the floor or slightly convergent as you come towards the surface of the tooth. So the cavity design is, has good retention and resistance form. Uh, your access allows you to eliminate necrotic dentine and you, you have convenience form, you're able to get your instruments into place. It also allows you to place an adhesive restoration because the surface area here is relatively small, so your occlusal from the tooth above it is going to have minimal impact on the restoration. This is your ideal for minimal cavities. For much larger cavities, uh, you will of course um, need to make different decisions about where you place the, the margins or the outline form and your materials. If it was going to look something like this, okay, you would need to, to probably have a dental material which was much stronger, much more compressive strength. And if you had a large cavity that needed um, um, preparation like this one, this burr may not be the most appropriate one to start with. But for minimal cavities, this is the ideal burr. There's a whole bunch of different shapes of, um, uh, cavity, uh, of cavity preparation in burrs. We've got uh, round, uh, uh, cone-shaped, uh, tapered burrs, uh, relatively straight burrs, which can all be used to cut different shapes in the tooth. The round burr could be